Good morning, community. Um, before I provide the COVID-19 update, I just want to, to acknowledge that while, while COVID-19 is a, a public health threat globally, um, I also want to acknowledge um, the recent UN report and the impact of climate change on, on global health um, and our health here in Marin County. Um, and recognize that we have a, a clear track record in Marin of seeing climate change as a public health crisis as well. I express my gratitude to the board and to our community for taking a, a science-driven and evidence-based approach to addressing that stronger existential threat, albeit more long-term, and look forward to, um, to moving our public health focus in that direction and want to you know, offer my commitment that we are not myopically focused just on, on COVID-19, especially as we see drought, fires, and other evidence of climate change emerging. Um, if I could have my slides, please, for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I'll provide an update with the numbers and then get into some of the key strategies for, for this week. So this is our, our, our epi curve. These are the number of new cases per day in Marin County. Um, on the right there, you see clear evidence of what we are calling the fourth wave or the fourth surge in cases. This is being observed across the nation, in fact, the world, and this is being driven by the Delta variant. Next slide, please. What's important about this surge and differs from previous surges is that it does not correspond to the same threat in terms of severe illness and death, largely because of vaccines. Right now, there are 11 people in the hospital in Marin County. The last time we had case rates this high, right now we're seeing about 45, on average, 45 new cases per day on the seven day, that's the seven day average. Last time we had rates that high in terms of our hospital, in terms of cases, it was around you know, February 1st. At that time, we had almost three times the number of people in the hospital. And that difference is really attributed to the benefit of vaccine in terms of preventing severe illness and death. Next slide, please. This is our case rates broken down by vaccination status. This is an element that's been added to our dashboard now for the past three weeks or so, um, and, and, and describes the difference between in case rates between what we call breakthrough cases, that is cases among people who have been vaccinated and people who are unvaccinated. And while 94% of our eligible residents have been vaccinated, people who are unvaccinated, that increasingly small fraction of our community still make up the vast majority of our cases. Uh, in fact, four times the case rate um, of people who are unvaccinated have had about four times higher rates. So the, the case rate among unvaccinated people is about 40 compared to nine um, in people who are um, vaccinated. Um, and in our hospitalizations, about 95% of our people in the hospital are unvaccinated residents. And so far, all of our deaths in Marin County have been among unvaccinated residents. Next slide, please. And this really tells um, tells the story in terms of the, the variants that are circulating in Marin County. We've been doing what's called whole genome sequencing that allows us to identify variants of concern as they emerge in relationship to the laboratories. And on the right there, you show that these are these each of these bars represents one week of sampling. And it shows that the last three weeks, 100% of our samples have been the Delta variant. There's the darker green, which is the, 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 the A, um, B1617.2, which is sort of the traditional Delta variant. And then there's the, the lighter greens are the Delta plus. They're just offspring of that Delta variant. They're still considered the Delta variant, um, but taken together, they represent 100% of all the samples that have been sequenced in Marin County over the past three weeks. Next slide, please. So we'll get into our, our vaccination status now. This is our, our dashboard as of today. 94.2% of our eligible residents have been vaccinated with at least one dose. 87% of eligible have had both doses. Um, and that's a total of, um, of 20, 210,000, over 210,000 of our residents have been vaccinated. Next slide, please. And that places us as still being the, the most highly vaccinated county in, in the state of California, which is a status we've maintained virtually since the beginning of tracking of this indicator across the state. Next slide, please. We are still uh, maintaining a steady, albeit much lower demand for vaccinations compared to the, uh, you know, when the vaccine was first rolled out. Um, we're doing about 300 vaccinations per day. Reassuringly, we haven't really seen a, 
a, a continuous decline. You know, there was a, a drop in but a drop in demand for vaccines. Um, but now over the past month, we've been doing pretty steady business with about 300 vaccinations per day over the past month. Um, the surge in the Delta variant and, and, and messaging and communication, people's awareness of their ongoing risk has led to a slight increase again in vaccination rates. Um, and we are focusing on historically under vaccinated groups. Next slide, please. And as you know, we've been taking a, a health equity and racial equity approach to our pandemic response in all, all elements of our response since the beginning. Now, most importantly, that applies to vaccinations. Um, we had our, our African-American residents were our and have been and continue to be our, our most undervaccinated um, community. Um, however, the vaccination rates with a focus in that community have risen to 80% um, and have been the highest uh, progress over the past month. So vaccination rates among African-American residents have risen at the highest rate compared to other racial ethnic groups. And that's due to a concerted strategy and strong community leadership in the African-American community, especially in Marin City and in parts of Novato. Next slide, please. So one of the, one of the most important themes uh, for this week and the, and the next month is going to be reopening schools. Um, we are obviously concerned about the Delta variant as we reopen schools. Um, elementary school students are not eligible to be vaccinated, so we have a vulnerable cohort right there built in. Um, and then an added, added element of caution is the, is the context. So if I'm looking at this slide compares last year with reopenings around August 5th versus this year. Last year on August 5th, 2020, our case rates were 34. So they were lower than they are now. And we are seeing a declining trend in daily cases, and there was no Delta variant. Um, this year, August 5th, our case rate is higher, and we're seeing an increasing trend. Um, and that's reflected on the, on the epi curve on the left. Um, and we have a more infectious variant. So this is one of the reasons why um, we really need to build on the success and the practices that were established for safely reopening schools last year to really double down and make sure that we're following every precaution we can. Next slide, please. So this is how we're keeping schools open and safe. Our primary organizer around our strategy for schools is full-time in-person learning for students across the county. Um, we're going to be leaning into the practices that were established in 2021 school year, maintaining strong public health and school partnerships. We have developed the, what was the last year, the 30 point plan uh, for public health guided site-based classroom instruction. That is now a 32 point plan. It is informed by the CDC and California Department of Public Health recommendations. We have established a, what has emerged as a very strong practice of school-based public health liaison. So every single school has two deep st school staff who serve as public health liaisons. And we have weekly meetings with those individuals just to walk through the processes, answer any questions they have, help guide them in, the, in their practices. Also, we're going to be recommending um, and requiring face covering on campus, state order for face covering indoors. We in Marin County are adding that we are recommending face covering for outdoors, um, and that is being required um, by school districts across the county um, because for the reasons I outlined in terms of the ongoing risk of the Delta variant, the fact that we're seeing increased transmission across, uh, across the county, um, and we want to start strong and if we don't see evidence of, of significant transmission, we can ratchet back and allow people to not cover their faces outdoors. But we want to start with the strongest possible standard and be conserved, knowing that, that face covering is a simple and effective measure for preventing transmission. We're also um, making sure that there are resources in place for testing children and staff who are symptomatic. And then we'll be closely you know, monitoring cases, monitoring the situation in schools very carefully um, to modify our practices as needed. Next, please. So state vaccination orders, um, just to, to remind the community what the governor had announced on July 26th and August 5th. By September, by September 30th, 2021, per governor's order, or the state health officer's order, um, all staff in hospitals and skilled nursing facilities must be vaccinated unless there's a religious or medical exemption. So these are those most highest risk acute care settings um, and then all staff in congregate care settings, which includes homeless shelters, um, jail, um, 
medical staff in those things, healthcare workers in those settings must be vaccinated or undergo weekly testing. Um, that also includes um, out, any outpatient setting. So dental offices, uh, primary care clinics, surgical clinics, et cetera, all, set it, all clinic, clinicians and other staff there need to go either be vaccinated or undergo weekly testing. And then um, staff vaccination must be verified and documented by the employer. No more self-attestation. So they have to actually check the, 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 and verify that the, the, the staff member has been vaccinated through the, the, either the paper form that is filled out when someone is vaccinated or the electronic verification form available from the state. And then additionally, visitors to acute care settings, including skilled nursing facilities and hospitals have to show proof of vaccination or negative COVID-19 test in the previous 48 hours to enter this facility. Next slide, please. So to summarize, the Delta variant is causing a resurgence, resurgence in COVID-19 infections across the nation and in Marin. Our local hospitalization rates are stable, mainly due to the protection of the vaccine. Vaccine is our best line of defense against serious illness. Facial covering remains a simple and effective tool, both for vaccinated and unvaccinated community members. Schools are reopening with caution and support and state vaccination policies are being implemented in the highest risk settings in Marin County. Next slide, please. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Matt. Gonna look for a board, board member of questions. Supervisor Conley. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Dr. Willis. Good morning, everyone. And really wanted to start as always by thanking you and the entire public health and healthcare system for the ongoing service you're providing to our community. Our gratitude cannot be overstated. Uh, so I have a series of questions. <clears throat> uh, starting with, I uh, wanted to talk about breakthrough cases and hopefully providing a little bit more of a deeper dive. Um, if symptoms arise, what experience and severity of a breakthrough illness? What is the likelihood that someone will experience a breakthrough case? Uh, in other words, understanding that uh, some settings are higher risk than others. And are there any commonalities among those experiencing a breakthrough case? And what we're finding um, in Marin is, is true across, you know, evidence that's emerging from across the nation, which is breakthrough cases are by and large much milder in terms of the symptoms. You know, people will often report it's more like a cold or even asymptomatic. In settings where they're doing routine screening testing, um, people who are vaccinated and are, who are found to be infected are often surprised that they've been infected because they're not having any symptoms at all. Um, as I said, the hospitalization risk for people who have been vaccinated is much lower. About 95% of our hospitalizations are among unvaccinated residents, despite the fact that they make up you know, less than 10% of our population. Um, so that's the most, I think the most critical point regarding um, the experience of breakthrough cases. Um, there is no specific setting where individuals are at higher risk for breakthrough infection um, who have been vaccinated than, than it's, you know, it's the same transmission dynamics are the same for people who have been vaccinated versus not vaccinated. The risk of being infected is higher if, being, if you're unvaccinated, but it's still based on proximity to someone who is infectious, um, especially indoors, and if, if facial covering is not used. Great. How much more transmissible is the Delta variant than the original COVID strain? Yeah, the evidence is that it's about 225% more infectious and more than twice as infectious as the other, uh, as the traditional native strain. Um, and that's really for three reasons. The first reason is that the number of virus particles in the, nasal, in the nose that's, you know, the, the swab is, uh, you're able actually to, to count the number of virus particles and there's about, about a thousand times more virus particles in the nasal pharynx for people who have been infected with the Delta variant compared to the other. So there's more virus particles. The other is that the infectious period is actually longer. So people who are infected with the Delta variant become infectious to others about 24 hours earlier than they would if they were infected with the non-Delta variant. So you're, you're infectious earlier that, and the viral load rises very, very quickly. And then finally, that spike protein allows the, cell, allows the virus to enter the cell more easily. So when you look in the Petri dish and you see 
Delta variant infected cells, they infect other cells around them much more quickly than other cells. So those are the three reasons why functionally in terms of the population it spreads much more quickly. Thanks. Um, when we met on July 20th, you shared that we had at that time three hospitalizations and one person in the ICU. Uh, at the cur now current numbers, as you reported, are 11 uh, people in the hospital and I believe four in ICU. So the question is, um, what are you seeing in Marin and throughout the Bay Area in terms of trend? Are we still, that suggests, as we all know, that we have been on an upward trend, but where do things stand now? Yeah, I think it's too early to, um, to really establish a, a trend. You know, we, can, we see that there's been somewhat of a plateau in our case rates over the past you know, seven to 10 days. Uh, we haven't seen that same sort of you know, meteoric rise that we saw kind of through, um, through July. You know, there was exponential increase in cases every day. We're not seeing that. Um, there's another factor there, which as, as the case rates rise, the turnaround times for testing actually increase. And remember, this, this is a theme from last year. So we, we don't want to be falsely reassured because we're actually taking it taking some longer for the reporting to come back. Um, the other is when we do wastewater sampling, um, we're, we're actually sampling in 11 different locations across the, the county wastewater for the presence of the virus. And we're seeing that the, the amount of virus in the wastewater still continues to increase. And that is another important sign for us that we might still be seeing increases in transmission. But if we look at our case rates, we do have a plateau of about the last 10 days where we haven't seen increases. So we're gonna be watching that. I think the next week and the week after are gonna be critical for us for actually trying to determine whether or not we're seeing a reassuring trend. In other places where there's been surges in Delta variants that are highly vaccinated, the UK, the Netherlands, there was a rapid rise, a quick plateau, and then it declined in similar fashion. So obviously that would be the ideal scenario for us, but it's too early to say. Thanks. And then on uh, next Tuesday, on August 17th, Sonoma County will be hearing a, a possible policy to require all Sonoma County staff to show proof of vaccination or undergo weekly COVID-19 testing. So the, my overall question is where do things stand with vaccine or testing requirements in Marin? You spoke uh, uh, earlier about uh, schools, uh, hospitals, healthcare settings, um, uh, jail and prison uh, where there are requirements now uh, through the state. Uh, but overall, in terms of uh, where things stand in Marin, if you could provide some elaboration. Yeah, our, our current policy approach as, you know, as, as the county is really to focus primarily on those things that the state has indicated are necessary because those are, those are the highest risk settings. Um, and we had been considering local policies um, that were really focused on those same settings because that's the obvious location where you really wanna make sure that that benefit of vaccine is strong in those settings. And the, and the state has come in and offered those, um, offer those orders across you know, a wide range of settings of, of risk, both congregate care settings, as well as acute hospital settings, healthcare settings. Um, and that's gonna be our focus over the next few weeks is really successful and full implementation of state policies for the benefit of our community. Um, we'll you know, be watching very carefully. We have a highly vaccinated community in the absence of some of those extra policies that are being implemented elsewhere. We are continuing to see uptake of vaccinations and our, our general principle of being, you know, as the least restrictive as we can be from the policy standpoint, uh, we're going to continue to to monitor our vaccination status, monitor our case rates, and consider additional policies if necessary. But right now, we're focusing on implementing the state policies. Thanks. Just a couple more areas. <clears throat> I wanted to hone in a little bit more on skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities. Uh, right now, 72.6% of all COVID deaths in Marin County are uh, uh, patients in such facilities. Um, data from August 6 shows two currently positive patients at facilities, but 18 positive staff uh, in those facilities. So what policies and practices exist in those settings? Well, I think it gets, it gets to the previous question, and you know, the, by far the most important policy to address that issue is is 
hundred, you know, trying to get to as close to hundred percent vaccination among staff as we can. Along and do we staff, do we actually have an idea of how what percentage of staff is vaccinated? Yeah, after we did, you know, we it was one of the highest priorities for our, you know, the earliest wave of our vaccination campaign in Marin County was getting out to the long-term care facilities, the skilled nursing facilities, vaccinating both staff and residents. At that point, we were about 90% in February. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of turnover. A lot of the, you know, uh, staff who, who work in those facilities, partly because of income and, and affordability in Marin, live outside of Marin County, um, where vaccination rates may be lower. Um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're constantly having to kind of revisit those settings to continue to vaccinate staff as that turnover occurs. Um, it's between 80 and 90% now, but because the Delta variant is so good at finding unvaccinated individuals, that's not good enough, um, especially in such a high risk setting as a skilled nursing facility. So that's the, by far, I think the most important strategy to address that issue where we're seeing more cases among staff than residents. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're fortunate that our resident, the vaccination rates among residents is above 95% in those settings. And so they are well protected against more severe illness and death. Um, and then the other policies that I mentioned in terms of visitation, so people who come into those settings um, have to be vaccinated or show that they've had a negative test. So we're not importing virus into those high risk settings um, as much. Right, and then final question. Um, you, you spoke about uh, local uh, requirements around masking uh, as an example. So just give us a sense of the criteria you have been looking at or will be looking at in terms of, uh, for example, the masking uh, requirements. Um, basically, what, what metrics are you looking at? in terms of making decisions yeah. going forward? Well, the, the role of the mask is to prevent transmission. And so we can look at, we can look at community transmission rates as, a, as, a, as an indicator of whether or not we need to continue to cover our faces. Right now, our, our transmission rates, are, we are, you know, if you go back to the blueprint, when we were looking at the, per, at the colored tiers, the cutoff for, for purple was seven cases per 100,000 residents. We're more than twice that right now. And we are one of the lowest rates in the state. Right now we have, I think we're number 51 out of 58 counties in terms of case rates. So that gives you an image of what's happening across the state. Um, you know, facial covering is a simple and effective tool that we can all use. We know that people who are vaccinated can be infected because of the properties of the Delta variant um, and can be infectious to others. And that's why we're continuing to commit to a policy where people cover their faces regardless of vaccination status indoors in public settings. If our transmission rates drop down to the, you know, that's called widespread transmission. If we get down to moderate transmission, which would correspond to the orange tier, that would be that would be an indicator where we could potentially feel sufficiently reassured that we could change some of our policies around facial covering. So following case rates and using that tier framework uh, would be the would be the the exit strategy for some of those policies. Thanks. Other questions from board members, Supervisor Rice. And just really quickly, thank you, Dr. Willis. Um, I have a quick question that's related to your, actually that last question and your response. So do we have a set, do we, can we surmise anything from the contact tracing that you're doing with these, um, these new, new infections as to what, what, do, what percentage of them is community spread versus coming in from travel outside from people and get, you know, leaving, leaving the community and, and sort of bringing it back? Yeah, it's, you know, at this point, it really is mostly community spread. Um, you know, it's, it's widespread enough in Marin that we represent, you know, the threats to one another, if you will. So because it's, uh, you know, when we have more than 14 cases per 100,000 residents per day, um, that's deep purple. Um, and so we really can't, we can't feel reassured by saying, well, well this, is a, this is a Marin County resident, you know, that, that we're less likely to be infectious. Um, we are seeing transmission in households. You know, that's when someone brings, brings the virus into a household, other people in that household are extremely vulnerable to being infected because people are generally by and large not covering their faces in, at home. It's, it's close contact. So, you know, when you look at, when I look at the daily cases, what I see is the same last name, you know, clusters of the same last name three or four times over and over again, because that's the, the household. So it's really an individual who's been infected in the community um, sometimes, and I think this is, an, this is a key point, in a, in a social gathering of some kind um, where you've been, where they may have been 
um, out without facial covering indoors, especially if it's a mixed group of people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated, um, especially if anyone is having symptoms. We're finding a concerning number of cases that emerge out of someone who um, maybe having cold-like symptoms, mild symptoms, sort of writes it off, ends up attending a gathering anyway. Um, and then others in that setting, even if they've been vaccinated, will be infected and then they bring it back home. And that, and you know, the others in that home are obviously vulnerable. And that just, you know, iterated so many times over the community with 250,000 residents ends up driving up our case counts in the aggregate. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Moulton Peters. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Willis, could you <clears throat> uh, provide a little explanation about herd immunity uh, that we had hoped to develop with the uh, vaccination and how the Delta variant has impacted uh, the concept of herd immunity at this point? Yeah, we've always been a little uncomfortable with this sort of binary idea of herd, herd immunity being sort of an on-off switch where, where you know, people who are you know, the way it was thought of, I think, sometimes erroneously was that the, the people who were unvaccinated could sort of ride on the coattails of people who were vaccinated. If enough of us were vaccinated, then those who remain unvaccinated would be protected sort of by proxy because the virus wouldn't be able to find enough hosts among that majority of vaccinated people and the transmission would die. The problem with the Delta variant, that was never, you know, a pure construct, but certainly now with the Delta variant, it's even less the case because people who are vaccinated are susceptible to infection and can infect others. And so um, that's one of the reasons why our policies have shifted to facial covering among vaccinated and unvaccinated residents. So herd immunity is, um, you know, I think we, we need to recognize that it is a continuum um, and that it is, it is not, a, not a useful construct for us at this point. We need to sort of recognize that every individual is at risk individually. Um, and that if you want to be protected, you need to seek the benefit of the vaccine rather than relying upon the fact that enough of, of, the, of those around you are vaccinated. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, 